started. The my talk is about what uh, COVID, what this uh, plant pandemic of 2020 teaches us about our planet. And I had prepared notes, but I think that I'll go spontaneously because I think that we're able to interact. Is that right? If there's people here, we can talk about it. So it can be more of a conversation since uh, it looks like there is Justin here. And I guess uh, Victoria, oh, no, maybe just Justin. Okay. So um, if there are other people here, I can't see them or hear them. Anyone else here? Okay, also it's recorded, yeah. so maybe other people will see it. Uh, I'm Alex Lightman, how are you? And I am the creator of the recently launched Lightman Report. I have done a segment on the impacts of COVID-19. So I'll just summarize that as of the time that we're doing this recording on the 1st of May, uh, 2020, there are 3.4 million people who are tested and recorded as infected, though the tests vary from place to place. The deaths in the US are about uh, 65,000. The deaths worldwide are about 240,000. And this has uh, exceeded the expectations of people when they were first talking about it. We have, of course, uh, President Trump infamously saying that he thought that this would uh, miraculously go away in April. April is now gone and there are over 1.3 million Americans who are infected. And one of the things that this shows us is that despite the potential of having a world that is decentralized and where many people can run experiments on the edge and on the periphery, that it's in fact very, very highly centralized. However, there is not a level of congruency between the golden triangle of management, the three things, authority, accountability, and responsibility. And the basic idea is that you have power, but that you have responsibility to actually do things. And then you have accountability so that people can evaluate how you've done and then uh, judge that and say, okay, you did a good job and you keep it. So uh, the gold standard to me for accountability and the way that the world used to work is that once upon a time, there was a company called Enron. Enron happened to be the biggest campaign contributor uh, to George H.W. Bush, uh, I'm sorry, George W. Bush, George, the, uh, George Jr. and his campaign. And they were on the cover of Fortune magazine with $135 billion. And then they collapsed because they were doing fraudulent accounting. And the company really collapsed rather than had to be reorganized because uh, an Arthur Anderson accountant took one piece of paper and shredded it and this became known. And it's just amazing to me how we've lowered our standards because for instance, the World Health Organization had said, we have studies that indicate there is no human to human transmission. In fact, that's a double lie. The first is that they had no studies. They said there are studies, there were no studies uh, that say that. And there was human to human transmission. And this caused a lot of governments who had centralized and they were looking to the who with no real reason. It's not um, a person who is a virologist who's running the who. It's not a person who's an expert. He's a, a though he has a medical background, he is a, a politician who had been known for covering up not one, not two, but three different cholera epidemics. So in our world today, one of the things that we've learned is that people in authority can get those positions because they're able to hide and obscure the problem rather than actually solve the problem. So it used to be that our world was, had, was uh, decentralized and then it was centralized, but with true experts at the top. And then it was one that became um, centralized with people who are fakes at the top. Uh, another thing is that if you have money, uh, you can, by the ability to have experts. And one of the things that's the most uh, shocking thing of all is the power of the, like the, the there's a, the whole idea of a, uh, a snowball rolling down the hill. So there's a, a book about Warren Buffett who started with $25,000 and has built a hundred billion dollar fortune starting with 25,000 and the reverse merger of a shirt company, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, and uh, that's just grown and grown and grown. Now, in this case, 
the world lockdown that we're going in now, the first time in history that half the people in the world have been quarantined and locked down, that all came out of a Bill Gates investment of $79,000 for a white paper that went to Imperial College. So a person there wrote what Bill Gates wanted. And Bill Gates has made no um, secret that he has a big PR agency, he's out there and he has pushing an agenda. And the agenda is very simple. Um, he knew that a pandemic was coming because he knew of the work, the dual use gain of function work going on with Zhang Lishi and others. And so it's very easy to predict when people are working on things and they're getting loose from laboratories or people are talking about using them or trying them out to know that at some point this thing is going to go out. And there is this Netflix series pandemic, which predicts what's going to happen. There's a pandemic explained, which used uh, on Netflix, which uh, uses some of the same footage that they gathered at the time. So all this media attention for his solution for a vaccine that would be against all coronaviruses and all flus, all this stuff is coming out at the same time. But the key thing is this. He pays $79,000 for a white paper at Imperial College. It goes out and all of a sudden it scares the hell out of Boris Johnson. It scares the hell out of Donald Trump because it says millions of people are going to die if you don't do this severe lockdown. And then within days of this paper going out and all these decisions being made very quickly, um, and I'll get to in a moment what that tells us about, but uh, Oxford criticized the paper on its merits. And the author of the paper uh, ag agreed with the criticism and basically withdrew it. However, we're continuing on with this. So what do we learn about this? That one person with one white paper can uh, in within weeks lock down half of humanity. I don't think that there's any other inhabited world in our galaxy where that can happen, where a world where it's uh, $80 trillion a year in GDP, so with $80,000, basically uh, three, six, nine, 12 orders of magnitude, something like that, nine orders of magnitude difference, you can, uh, you can massively impact the, the world economy. Uh, and what we have right now in the United States is 30 million people uh, uh, unemployed, filing for unemployment. And I've heard someone today uh, just say, just a few minutes before I started this, that we're now at the peak. We're not near the peak at all. So it's uh, we now are going to see, uh, mo most of the people in the United States are employed by small businesses. So small businesses account by for by far the greatest number of jobs. Last time I looked at the Fortune uh, 500, the, the biggest companies, biggest publicly traded companies in the United States, their total employment was about 13 million and they were reducing that number. So that number was getting smaller. So fewer than about 7% or so of the people in the United States are working for large companies and those people are getting the biggest bailout. So billionaires have gotten 281 billion, uh, have gotten $281 billion richer since this whole thing began. And the majority of people though are employed by small business. So small businesses, uh, very often have about one month's worth of cash. So let's say that you have a big hearted manager, your restaurants closed down, your retail shops closed down, your small manufacturing facilities closed down, your water testing business, whatever it is, and you've kept your employees on for a month. Well, you've just run out of money. So we're gonna probably have more people filing for unemployment this month, this month of May, since this is the first of May, than we had in April, we had 30 million in April. So if we have 60 million people out of 160 million people in the workforce, uh, that's a hell of a lot of people out of work. And already, even with 160 million people in our workforce, we had 300, about 350 million people in our population. And it's a little bit more than the, than the official statistics because we have a lot of undocumented people in the country. And we have a lot of visitors, including uh, uh, over half a million people from China are, are weathering out the quarantine here in the United States rather than being in China. Uh, we will, you know, we will see basically uh, an un unemployment rate that is above above 30% or so. 
And there's no, there's no person, there's no futurist, not me, not anyone who projected that kind of unemployment. So the unemployment is worse than we, than we knew. Now, let's look at the big picture of employment for a second to see the true horror that this will cause. There are about 8 billion people in the world. I know the official statistics are about 7.77, but China undercounts purposely. China's population isn't 1.35 billion people, it's 1.75 billion. They purposely undercount it, so it's very easy to have the statistics keep showing growth. If you don't count 400 million people, then you can keep adding later. It's what com some companies do. They understate their revenues or they understate their earnings by putting it off in the pension fund, like extra contributions to the pension funds. They keep their profits down. And that way they can make a prediction about the earnings. It's called shaping earnings or crafting earnings. And so you can also do that with growth. Well, we have 8 billion people in the world and, of, and we have about 5 billion people who are working age who could work. And we have about 3 billion people actively looking for full-time work. And we have about 1.2 billion people who have jobs. However, with this world lockdown, we may have as many as 600 million people unemployed. There isn't even a statistic. And so all of a sudden we realize another thing about our planet, because remember, if, if you've come in late, this, the, the title of this talk is uh, what the pandemic of 2020 teaches us. We don't have reliable statistics. We don't have reliable statistics on health. We don't have reliable statistics on population. We don't have reliable statistics on employment and unemployment. But if we have 600 million people or 500 or 400 or 300 or 200 million out of work, uh, let's just say with any of those, then we only have uh, between 600 and 900 million people who are supposed to carry the other 7.1 to 7.3 billion people in the world on their backs. And there isn't enough money to do that. The economic system is not made to do that. So what's going to happen, um, as far as we can tell, unless somebody has a, a bunch of robots hidden in a, in a giant warehouse, like uh, in the second Hellboy movie, the Hellboy and the Golden Army, you know, he finds this giant warehouse full of uh, Golden Army robots and uh, made by the magical elves. Unless there's something like that to put people to work, now, right now is the time, uh, even late in the season, for planting crops, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, which is where most of the world's population lives. So we won't be planting the crops, so we won't be harvesting them. And we have a lot of animals that are not getting fed. So people who are, are meat eaters, uh, they're actually burying cows and sheep and ducks and pigs alive. In China, there was already a shortage because we have not one pandemic right now. We actually have more like six. Uh, one of them though is swine flu and because it's killing animals, we don't notice it as much but we may end up with hundreds of millions, possibly even billions of animals buried alive or killed and, and just wasted. So just in China alone, China is about 22% of the population, we've lost 250 million pigs because of their current version of the swine flu. And so China has always assumed, well, we'll just import. And China has uh, the biggest foreign currency reserve, so they assume that they can import all they want. But because this has gone out and affected the world now, we cannot be assured of a food supply. So another thing that we've learned is that we still need to grow food. We still need to be able to have our own. So what's, what I've noticed is a surge of people looking at how to grow gardens on their balconies. What can you grow? Well, it's very hard to have high caloric, caloric density plants that you can grow on your balcony. So it is possible to grow cucumbers, but cucumbers barely even replace the calories that it takes to consume them. You can grow tomatoes, but tomatoes don't basically give you enough calories. So we, we really need, um, we realize that some of the people who are advising us and, and exhorting us, I knew Bill Mollison while he was alive, he's now dead. He was the creator of, of permaculture. And I hired him to come from Australia and work with me on the 126 acres that I bought for the Najoni School in Santa Fe. And he showed us how to make permaculture. 
And he was saying basically that we would be having a pandemic that he, he predicted all of this stuff. He didn't predict the date, but he did say, and this was back in the late 1980s, I think 1989, he did say, you know, that there would be people who would be starving to death in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which doesn't grow very many crops because it's very high up in the altitude and you can't really grow plants as well at high altitudes. It's not enough rain, you need rain, you need water, all every acre foot of water is there. So we've allowed ourselves to be disconnected from growing food. And we have all kinds of zoning laws and prohibitions on growing food. In fact, right now, there should be an emergency declaration that everybody's front yard and everybody's backyard and everybody's roof and everybody's porch and everything is fair game to grow food plants on because we need to make sure that we don't run out of food. Now, why do we know, need to not run out of food? Well, I happen to have written a book on food security, food security via clean energy. It's not published yet. I kept, uh, you know, I wanted to have some chapter that would bring it all to a good conclusion because I, I find it hard to conclude nonfiction books because I'm always learning something new and wanting to put it in there. But here's the problem that we can see from t uh, over time. Whenever that, that wars and pandemics are actually relatively common and pandemics throughout history are as common as wars. So if you have a war that affects a certain region, there's pretty much as many pandemics that affect that region. And when you even have world wars, you have global pandemics. So we have World War I, we have World War II, and we have the influenza, uh, the great influenza epidemic of 1918 to uh, 1920. Now, it used to be that they said that there are 50 to 100 million people who died. I've recently heard that they've actually narrowed the number down to 65 million. Now that was bacterial and it actually would turn people color so badly that there are people, I've read firsthand accounts that people that who are uh, black people and white people who had died, you couldn't tell the difference to them. And they even had an, a whole army of people who would paint corpses because the coloration was so disfigured from that. So this isn't nearly that um, grotesque in terms of how it looks, but it's, um, it's more contagious. So we know we can get it from breathing. And we might think, well, you know, this the number of people that we have now, about 230, 240,000 people who've died. I guess we're at the peak. I hear people talking about being at the peak as if there's only going to be 500,000 people who died. That's not the case because we have half the people in the world on lockdown and many of them have weakened their immune systems by going inside. They are uh, one of the comorbidities that is there is obesity, uh, heart conditions, uh, cancer, being on chemo, all these weakened immune systems. But another thing is vitamin C, I'm uh, sorry, vitamin D insufficiency. And human beings cannot produce our own vitamin D and uh, only a tiny fraction of people are regularly supplementing all that they need consistently. The way that we get most of our vitamin D is being out in the sun. And most people are not making sure they get enough sun while they're in lockdown. I mean, I've seen pictures of people who came out of Wuhan and they were pretty pale. So uh, I once uh, had a girlfriend who worked in Antarctica. She worked there for 18 months. Everybody was healthy. And then from one day to the next, everybody was sick. And they traced it and said, why did everybody get sick? And the answer is that somebody had opened up a trunk that they hadn't opened up for a few months. And there was some bacteria or some mold there somehow that it got them and then it got everybody else. And because that they were in Antarctica, they had deconditioned their adaptive immune system so that they found it uh, possible to become more contagious. Now, I, uh, I, I just got stung by a, a close friend saying, oh my God, you know, you're terrible at science. Well, I'm not terrible at science. I finished uh, my MIT degree requirements in two and a half years, and I have written several books on technology with, as far as I know, no mistakes. But here's how I'm doing. I'm only speaking for myself. I'm not a doctor, but I'm thinking that it's very dangerous in a world where SARS-CoV-2 and its mutations and its strains, and we know of at least 30 strains, and we know that the human genome is only changed by about 1% over the last 
uh, 8 million years. And this is mutating, I've heard, by 1% a day. So this thing could get less virulent, less contagious, or it could get more, it could get both. And we have a milder strain of this in California than they have in New York City, obviously, because New York State has half our population, but about 20 times our, our deaths. But there's nothing stopping people once New York is off lockdown from coming here to California. And we do not know whether exposure to the weakest strain and the mildest strain gives uh, confers total immunity forever to the strongest strains. We don't know that yet. This is a, another thing we're learning about the world is that we all now need to be citizen scientists. Uh, David and or Orban and I, um, David has a daily uh, video. He's committed to doing daily sharing of information. Highly recommend tuning into that. But uh, David um, and I organized the first conference on the rise of the citizen scientist. Harvard University, much in the news these days for both good and bad reasons, are, uh, it loaned us their science center for three days. We had 60 people in two days, including Ray Kurzweil and Stephen Wolfram come there. And basically all of them were addressing the fact that we need to have more citizen scientists. So what's very important for us to do now is record our own experience. What are we eating? What exercise? Are you going outside? What supplements are you taking? Because we need to have that data. The problem that's happening right now from my perspective is that there isn't a sane, rational, objective collecting of data so that, uh, we need to basically, uh, yes, yeah, somebody, Natasha is saying that uh, biohacking and the quantified self. Yes, that's exactly right. In fact, I, I have a whole thing at the biohacker uh, conference that was a, a few weeks ago. I think you can find the video. Um, and I wish I had more time. I would talk about that now. I've got eight more minutes. But basically, we need to be keeping track of all this and sharing it because otherwise we won't be as prepared for the next pandemic. And there is one thing that people are saying which is simply not true. I say this as a futurist with a, a 35 year track record of making predictions without any major mistakes, as far as I know. And that is that there's a, the, the single most wrong statement is that this is a once in a century pandemic if we're talking about the future. Because I happen to be with the crowd of people that uh, uh, includes President Trump, but it doesn't include very many other people, that this has uh, a lab, uh, lab origin. And if you have, you do have billions of dollars that has gone into dual use gain of function. And even at Wuhan Institute of Virology alone, it is not a secret that they have over 1,500 coronaviruses. Now this lab, and there's a P4 lab and a P3, some people are saying, oh, it happened from the P3, not the P4, but has let SARS out four times that are not disputed. We don't know about other times. So, a lab, which basically labs are leaking out of, that has 1,500 coronaviruses, statistically some of which would, could be more virulent than the one we're experiencing now. And we also see that you can put out, let's say this is a bioweapon. Well, it's very, very hard to prove. And you also have a lot of people who, let's say that you have a Republican in office, and he says, oh, well, this country did it. Then the opposition, especially in election year, will say, well, you're wrong and you're stupid, so no, they didn't. In other words, the opposition will argue with whatever someone says. So you have something that is rare, is very rare, which is that you can, you could potentially kill hundreds of thousands of people and over 60,000 Americans and get away with it because there isn't the way of proving um, that this is done. And so we, we basically have a situation whereby we need to prepare for more pandemics. Now, how do you prepare for a pandemic? How do you prepare for something? You have to boost your immune system, which means that you, uh, and this is the, the best thing, this is the positive. I'll end on a, a positive note uh, in the last few minutes. Uh, you have the whole biohacking thing. Uh, Dave Asprey, uh, I, I've heard uh, in his seminars, I've been to a few of them, Justin, Dudek, who's on, the, on this call, has invited me. Thank you very much, as Dave Asprey has himself. But uh, the basic idea is that there are vitamins, there are minerals, there are peptides, uh, there's exercise, 
And then there are ways in which you can uh, boost your immune system by growing your thymus. So you have your heart and above your, uh, a little tiny, kind of looks like a heart that's above the heart, uh, which is the finishing school for the immune system. So you have your natural killer cells and your T cells. A lot of our immune system comes from our bones. And basically they have to go and attach to the surface and then through a kind of a, a, a osmosis, they are learning about how, what's you and what's not you so that it doesn't attack you. People with autoimmune deficiencies and uh, where, so Hashimoto syndrome or lupus, their immune system is attacking them. And we have to learn from this how to supercharge our immune system, how to regrow the thymus, because when it's exposed to estrogen and testosterone, it gets withers, it gets smaller, it gets darker, the surface area declines. And so this is why 90% of the people who die of flu are over the age of 65, because they have a withered thymus and they have a, a not uh, instructed new cells. And what we're going to need to pioneer, the next big thing we need to do is become experts at 3D printing uh, biocompatible thymus. And basically we need, to, uh, we need to be able to then do thymus transplants. So I'm thinking that if we really wanna have reduced our death rate, that people over the age of 55, 60, or whose thymus is shrunk by let's say more than 80%, 90%, uh, then we we need to replace that. And uh, another thing that we need to do is we need to live in communities with people who observe a whole different level of sanitation. I guess uh, I would say that we need to have the highest Asian standards and bring them to the West. So one of the things that a high standard of Asian uh, cleanliness is that you take off your shoes at the door, or if you're taking them off inside, you have a way of sterilizing it. And the way there's two major ways that you can sterilize things now. The first one is to have a UV light, an ultraviolet light. And the second thing is to have uh, an ozone generator. I have an ozone generator. Uh, and it's a, basically what you can do is you can turn it on, you can put a timer on it, let's say for a half an hour or so, and you turn it on. And then you go out for a walk. And then you have it so it's turned off and you have about a half an hour, an hour to let the place clear out. If you can leave a window open, that's great. So then when you have the ozone there, the ozone will take care of many of the pathogens, viral and bacterial and so on. We also need to coat a lot of our surfaces with uh, coatings that are antiviral and copper. Copper is very antiviral. So we wanna basically take things that have little tiny, tiny pieces of copper and put that on and coat any place where we're going to put our hands or put our feet or uh, where we're going to put our hands, especially if we're going to touch our faces afterwards. We're going to need to get much better about local sufficiency, self-sufficiency for masks, gloves, disinfectants, uh, and coatings for this. We've had the horrible experience of basically seeing a, a giant number of people get a direction from China to their companies to have the employees go out in the United States, Australia, and the UK, and possibly other countries, but those are the three I have confirmed reports about. And they cleared out and bought all of the masks from all the Lowe's and the Home Depots and the Orchard Hardware, and they cleared out all the gloves, they cleared out all of the, uh, all of the disinfectants. And so basically we didn't have that. And uh, I still see in Los Angeles to this day I would say probably 95% of the people I see in my walks as I'm walking around because I got masks early on, I was prepared with it. They're wearing bandana, bandanas. And one of the other things that this tells us about the world is that we don't have a really good idea of the relative scale of things. So we are, I think it's 40 orders of magnitude between the smallest things like Planck scale and the largest things. And we're about in the middle of that. And so we have to be really, really clear about what is tiny and will go through the mask and what won't. So I guess uh, my time is up. I hope this has been useful and interesting. And um, uh, feel free to follow me on Facebook, uh, at my Paul Alex Lightman uh, Futurist and Policy Advisor, or my regular personal page uh, a, on Facebook. And I have the Lightman Report on YouTube. Thank you for your time. Hope you uh, survived this and that you come out of it stronger than before to get peptides. Uh, if you want to get peptides, you might have to get cryptocurrency. 
and um, but and look into that. So, okay, any questions? Anything you want to discuss until they kick us off this room? Or if somebody else is a speaker and you need to take over this room uh, from me, just tell me and I'll leave. I'm not sure how this works. Any questions? Okay, well, great. I hope this is useful. Um, thank you for your time. And I look forward to being friends and continuing the discussion online if you would like to do that. Um, I wish you well. Bye-bye.